Special thanks to the Kay Family Foundation Lead Underwriters for Mosaic. Hello, my name is Barbara Kay, and on behalf of the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County, I'd like to welcome you to our program, Mosaic. I'd like to give a special welcome to my new co-host, Susan Pertnoy. It's a pleasure to have you with me. It's great to be here, Barbara. And today's a special day. We're on location at the Mandel Public Library in West Palm Beach. And because of the amazing exhibit called Band and Burn, which is a traveling exhibit from the Holocaust Memorial Museum from Washington, D.C., which is going to be in the library through January 9th. We're going to meet the people that are involved in it, and we're going to talk about it. We'll be back with our guests and our program right after this brief message. It happened. The downswing happened. I became unemployed with, uh, in a short period of time because there was no business. Somehow, I don't know, God was looking over us, or my grandparents, or my, my father, somebody was looking over us and, and said, make this phone call. And, they came through with, uh, and I thank God for it every day. Jewish people all over the world uh, feel as if they're a family. And it's important to think of the Federation as part of your family. Family is very important to me. Federation is important to me. Welcome back to Mosaic, and welcome Christopher Murray, director of the Mandel Public Library. Thank you very much. Welcome to our library. Thank you. As director of the library, what do you see as the library's role or mission to its members of the community? Well, our mission is to connect people with ideas and information. We do that in various ways, and this exhibit from the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum is an amazing uh, opportunity for people to come in and see and exhibit many things I think people won't know because we never got that far in history to see World War II and the American response to me is something I'd never heard about before. Do you see any changes in direction now that the name is the Mandel Public Library? Well yes, we are going to be doing more programming. One of the, one of the focuses of the Mandel Grant was to increase the programming Libraries are becoming community gathering places, and this will give us a chance. We, we never actually had much funding to do programming, and the Mandel Foundation has given us money that's specifically targeted to do funding, and we, we, we're just in the process of hiring a programming librarian now to, to go out and find different kinds of programs that we can actually pay for now. Okay, can you, apropos to that, can you share with us some of the, the ideas of the new programming, such as the health initiatives? Um, at this point in time, we haven't got that person on board yet, and we're going to kind of let them take some community assessments. We have some ideas that we'll be sharing with them. There, there are some things like, you know, English is a second language that we know is, of course, it's needed for people. Uh, we have some health initiatives already. We, we got a grant from the um, 
Quantum Foundation several years ago when we implemented yoga, Pilates, Latin cardio, and other different types of health programs that, that have been wildly popular. And what about your literacy programs for the children? We have the most amazing children's department here that I've ever seen. I've been in a lot of big libraries in Charlotte and Nashville. These guys, they do everything they do is interactive. And they work with the children. Uh, we have some children's early literacy computers that you get on. And the keyboards are different colors. And they, the kids are this big, yet they get on the computers and they get around because it says, hit the blue side of the mouse or hit the yellow side of the mouse. The kids don't know left and right at this point yet, but they have early literacy programs in, in English and in Spanish, and our story times are just spectacular. The, they, the staff work on them extensively, and every story time has something built in that's a learning experience. It's not like when I was a child and we just read a story to you. And there's something going on besides the story in every story time. That's, that's marvelous. You also, I read somewhere where you are helping the public with job opportunities, being an inter informational center yes. for that. We, we've been doing that. Uh, we got a grant two years ago from the uh, Library Services and Technology Act, and we partnered with the Workforce Alliance, and we created a program called Career Catalyst. We bring people in, we teach them how to write a resume, how to search for jobs in the internet, how to uh, practice for an interview and how to actually do other kinds of job search skills. Um, right now we're going to try to go for part two. We, we, we know from working with people here that a lot of people from the VA, they don't have enough equipment to train everybody who needs job search skills and even basic computer stuff a lot of times. So they've been coming down here and using us and we're going to go for a revised LSTA grant this year to try to get funding to actually really expand it bring somebody from Workforce Alliance down here regularly, bring some people from VA down regularly, and really expand that. Because they had an estimate, I think, uh, right now there's like 200,000 people, Afghanistan and Iraq, back from the service, out of work. They say by like 2,000, I think it's 15 or 16, it'll be a million. That's amazing. Yeah. You sounds like you have some very exciting programs in the works here. We do, and we have a great staff. That's what really makes it. These guys are brilliant. This is the most amazing group of people I've ever worked with. That's tremendous. Now let me ask you this. What directed you to have the Holocaust Memorial Museum's banned and burned exhibit at the Mandel Public Library? Well, I got help. I got Jim Sugarman is our executive director of our foundation. And this guy has been brilliant since he got here about two years ago now. And he is looked out and reached out in different directions in the community. And I believe he actually knew somebody at the Holocaust Museum that uh, he found out about this as a possible traveling exhibition. He said, sure, let's figure out where we can fit it, you know, what space would work out. And we basically cleared out the entire east side of the uh, fourth floor, the, basically the grand reading room. And we have it all on the east side. And it's a great exhibit if you haven't been there yet. Uh, I was there a little earlier today just to bone up <laughs> and find out what was going on. But it's really, um, this is one of the things that libraries do. Uh, it, it provides information to people in an interactive format, like with the children's room, that they probably wouldn't encounter otherwise, many of the people. Do you have other um, opportunities to expand on the exhibit in our area schools? Uh, yeah, they, they're having a lot of schools come down to visit the exhibit, and um, we actually have, I know this week, we have a huge committee, all these people who volunteered to help with the exhibit, and uh, people from the committee have come in and they've talked to the children about their experiences. One, Jim, is a Holocaust survivor, and he's talked to the children about and the, the focus, the, in, the importance of book burning, which is, uh, <laughs> it's funny, because you talk to junior high schools today, they'll, well, if they burn the books, you just read them on the e-reader, you know, but, but that's not the way it was you know, at the time. Well, I appreciate you joining us today, okay. and thank you very much, well, and I'm very you. excited to see the Thanks exhibit. Thanks for having me. We hope you come back often. Thank you. I okay? will. Thank, thank you. you. Next, Barbara will be speaking with the Executive Director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Sarah, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's great to be back with you, Barbara. Yeah, my goodness. Uh, I saw you in Washington. You look wonderful. 
Well, it's great to be down here in sunny Florida. It's a lot warmer than Washington these days. We're going to talk eventually about the exhibit, and later you're going to show us through it so that our viewers can have uh, the pleasure of the experience. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the Holocaust Museum in Washington, the Memorial Museum, and why it's so important to the community to have such a uh, museum in place. Well, first of all, I would say location, location, location. No question. Okay. We sit on the National Mall, and we sit right in between two of our most important monuments to freedom, the Jefferson Memorial and the Washington Monument. And I think there's no more powerful institution that speaks to the fragility of human freedom and democracy than our museum, mm -hmm. per particularly situated between those two monuments. Mm. We also sit right next to the Smithsonian, which celebrates human achievement. And we remind people that human achievement also has its very dark side. So I think where we sit, we form part of our national discourse of a people. What does it mean to be American? What does freedom mean? What is the nature of hate, the dangers of indifference? What's our responsibility as citizens, not only of our own country, but in this day and age of the world? Yeah. You know, you're celebrating your 20th anniversary. You've been there since the very beginning. And there are many challenges that you had. You've done so many things. What do you think is your major accomplishment there, frankly? Don't tell me it's your website. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you it's the website. Because it's a wonderful website. I would say, well, let me say two things. One is having been there in the beginning and seen all the discussions and the arguments and the anguish we had, would anyone come? Would mm. non-Jews come? Would anyone come back? The fact that this museum has become so universally not only accepted, but respected. All visiting heads of state come to Washington. They come to our mm -hmm. museum. We've had 100 of them. We've had over 10 million school children, people from all over the world. That, to me, as someone in there on the founding staff, is just a miracle in itself. And then the second kind of miracle is what you alluded to. We never imagined we would become a global. But now, in today's world, we have to become global. And our problems are global, but so are our opportunities. And the museum sees that it can play an enormous role in the global discourse about humanity. Yeah, you would do a lot of outreach. In other words, the exhibit that, you, that we're seeing here today is a, is a form of outreach as well. Absolutely. Well, the reality is, I mean, we're America's memorial to the Holocaust, but most Americans don't even come to their national capital, yeah. let alone to our museum. So how do we get ourselves to Americans? So we send traveling exhibitions around the country. We do teacher training. We do public programming. We're on college campuses. We try to be everywhere. Yeah, you know, and you have an interactive experience when you go into the museum. It's not like you walk in and look at things. There's an, you have a, a way of giving your, your, the individual a chance to express themselves and have something in return. When my grandchildren came to the Holocaust Museum, and you took them through the children's exhibit down there. Explain Daniel's what, story. Daniel's story. Explain what takes place. Well, one of our challenges, by the way, was how would we accommodate younger visitors? Younger visitors, And yeah. tourists in Washington, and our visitors are 90% non-Jewish, and they come yeah. in families. So we needed a special program for young visitors. So we consulted child psychologists about the best way to present the Holocaust, to introduce it to young people. And our exhibit is for ages 8 and up. And it introduces young people to the Holocaust through Daniel, who's a composite child based on mm. historical figures who was eight years old when the Nazis came to power. And it shows how his life gradually changes as the Nazis become more entrenched in their authority and, and the rules they impose on the Jews in society. And then it takes him actually through the war and through ultimately the Holocaust and the loss of his family. But it does all this through the perspective of a child's eyes. And it's completely environmental and interactive. Children can see Daniel's bedroom, jump on his bed, Leave a play note. with his toys, write him notes, mm -hmm. and then see how his life, his environment, his settings changed as the obviously the historical tide was unfolding. And I have to say, it's one of our most popular offerings, even with adults as well as children. Yeah, it's amazing because when you talk about going to the a, a memorial, a Holocaust memorial museum, people feel they're going to see things that upset them. But really there is, there's a lot of hope in that museum. Well, when we were building the museum, this was a big topic of discussion, was there was a perception out there we'd be just be, to quote, a house of horrors. Yeah. And we worked very deliberately so that people saw this was a place about humanity. Mm. And we tried hard to very much humanize our victims 
and to not show them as victims. Most people think of the Holocaust and you see those skeletal images of people with their heads shaved in concentration camp uniforms. But we wanted to show those victims before they became victims in the fullness of their life and the diversity of Jewish life throughout Europe. And so we take various opportunities throughout our exhibit to remind people this happened to people like you and me. They look like people like you and me. They had the same hopes and dreams and wishes for their future. And that has been really one of the great, I to use this, but formulas of our success because people leave and say to us, you know, I knew something about the Holocaust before, but you personalized it for me in a way that mm -hmm. helped me understand it in a new dimension. Yeah. You know, you even had soldiers coming through. Yes. When I was there last time, there was a whole uh, barrage of soldiers. What were they doing there? Well, if you look at the Holocaust, it was a failure of both leadership and citizenship. Right. So our two most important audiences are youth and leaders. And you, what you mentioned is one of our leadership training programs. We train every new FBI agent, students from our military academies, um, other members of the military who are becoming officers. Uh, we train state and federal judges. And what these individuals do is they look at their own profession and how did that profession behave when Germany was a democracy, a struggling democracy, and how was that profession gradually co-opted by the Nazis into totalitarianism and eventually war and genocide. And this leads to a discussion about their own moral responsibilities mm -hmm. in the world today. Because think about it, the military, the law enforcement, the judiciary, these are our safeguards in a democratic society. No, you're right. I have to tell you, I want to hear more about all of this. And you're going to take us, uh, Susan and myself, and our viewers through, an, through the exhibit and explain it all. Because I, it's something I want everybody to see. Wonderful. Yeah. So at this moment, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with the remainder of our program right after this brief message. Welcome back to Mosaic, and welcome back to you, Mort Mandel. Where's your beautiful wife, Barbara? Barbara is right, be, right sitting next to me, but she's not on the camera, so she's going to let me have it for... Uh, okay, oh, well, I tell her, tell her my best wishes, okay? Yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. <laughs> Listen, your name and Barbara's name is on the front of this public library. Right. What an amazing thing. What made you do it? Actually, <clears throat> uh, we were uh, interested and doing something uh, generous for the town of Palm Beach, West Palm Beach in this case. And uh, we've been just mildly looking, uh, in a sense, uh, probably a year. And uh, the uh, then ex-mayor, Lori Frankel, mm -hmm. uh, met us <laughs> and uh, came over the house, actually, uh, and told us about this highlight of her, one of the, uh, she may have said the, highlight of her career in terms of improving the quality of life in uh, West Palm Beach was this beautiful library. library. And it was looking for a sponsor. Uh, you know, maybe we'd be interested. Anyway, to make a long story short, we met her here the next morning with the director of the library, uh, uh, Chris Murray, and the head of the West Palm Beach Library Foundation, West Palm Beach Library Foundation, uh, Sandy Myers, and we took a tour. And I'll tell you where there was a big click in both Barbara's Barbara, and yeah. my head. Uh, we made the tour, a very impressive tour, and we came across in a corner of the third floor. A dog. A dog. <laughs> you gonna say and that? there was a little boy, I'm guessing age six, perhaps, uh -huh reading in a very serious way to the dog. The dog was lying with the dog's head uh, on, the, on the ground as though the dog were listening. And I said, what's going on? And there was a woman about six or seven feet away sitting in a chair, stood up and said, that's my son. And I want to tell you what happened. And she went on to describe the fact that he, he read poorly in the first grade and the kids laughed at him and he became very sensitive and was just a reading, it was a reading problem with him until they heard about this dog. 
and this was the third or fourth time he had read to the dog, and he has overcome his embarrassment, his feeling of awkward, his awkward feeling in front of uh, his class, because the dog listened to him uh -huh. without laughing at him, without doing anything like that, and she had tears rolling down her cheeks, uh -huh. the mother. And, you know, that, I just resonated to that. Now, that's just a small thing. It's uh, one of the many things here. I think that was sort of the uh, frosting on the cake. cake. Okay, that, that was it. I know Barbara told me that really moved her. Yeah. Yeah. You know something? You have a terrific exhibit that's uh, shown here today, right. Band and Burn. And it tells a very important story, and it's a very important educational opportunity. Don't you feel good about having this library being able to do that? Yes. What I feel good about, of course, is the exhibit. What I feel good about is this library is not just a collection of books or DVDs no. or motion pictures, mm. which is what I grew up with. When I was younger, uh, I walked to the nearby library and I took out books. This is a community center. Mm -hmm. This is uh, a, a meeting place for all sorts of activities, really contributing to the quality of life in West Palm Beach. It really is doing what I had dreamed it, it would do. And this particular exhibit, of course, is, uh, is uh, a, a very important uh, lesson, really, for all, all people who see it, to just see what could happen, and, and, and just to know about bystanders. There were a lot of bystanders during mm -hmm. the Holocaust. And so it's a, it's a very moving experience, per se, but I'm thrilled that it's in the, may I say, Mandel Public Library. Well, you've done a lot of very good things, you and your family. The JCC in North Palm Beach is, is going to be called the Mandel JCC, right, right. and on and on. And when they say, when you work with Mandel, you not only get a wonderful check, but you also get a partner. And you have transformed Cleveland. Every place you've lived has been made better because of you, Barbara, and your family. Well, thank you. And I have to tell you, you're amazing, both of you. At any rate, at this point, we're going to go and look at the exhibit. You're not so bad yourself. <laughs> I want that in the tape. <laughs> and it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. This is my second time. Of course, now I'm experienced. That's true. This is my, I think it was, what, 10 years ago or mm -hmm. something like that? Anyway, it was a pleasure. Yeah, Let's go too. see the exhibit, OK? Thank you. Thank you. OK, Sarah. OK, so now here we are with the exhibit. What are we looking at here? Well, this is the very beginning of the exhibit, and this is showing a picture of the, the book burnings itself. It's a little, this is, uh, picture is not that clear because obviously the book burnings will unfold later in the exhibit, but you see a, a young German student swearing to Hitler, and here you can see the beginning of the burning of the books. And what's over here? Well, here we point out, we go back to when Hitler comes to power, January 30th, 1933. Mm -hmm. And actually the book burnings begin shortly after he comes to power in May of 33. And what's so interesting about this period is Hitler's power is not solidified. He still has to win over many of the elites of German society. So these early months in the, in, for back throughout 1933 is a time when Hitler could have been stopped. Of course, no one could have imagined mm -hmm. where things were headed. But his power was very fragile. But he comes to power in January, and then the book burnings begin just a few months later. You know what I read? I think it was Goebbels that burned the books and spoke, and there were about 40,000 people that were mesmerized with what he had to say. Well, they were we college students. We have Goebbels right here, okay. the person you mentioned. And he was, of course, the Minister of Propaganda. Notice they called the Minister of Public Enlightenment, Enlightenment. and Propaganda. And by the way, they thought propaganda was a positive word. They actually discussed whether or not to use that word. Sarah, would you explain this to us, please? Sure. This is, now we see a much bigger picture that we saw in the beginning of the book burnings. And you can see the mass of crowds, as you can see all around. I mean, this is just a small shot. And the flames here in the center. Um, they were burning thousands and thousands of books. I think it's uh, almost 600 different authors were, whose books were being burned. What do we have here now, Sarah? Well, this, Heinrich Heine was a very uh, well-respected German-Jewish poet. and. He said, where one burns books, one will soon burn people. Now, he said this in 1823. But of wow. course, it was incredibly prophetic by the world that he is, he would, his countrymen would live in 100 years later. Now, the whole point of the exhibit is not just what happened in Germany, but what happened in America. And the response was really extraordinary. I want to share with you something amazing. I mean, this is Newsweek magazine that we're all familiar with, an early edition. 
And here it is, May of 1933. And they actually refer to the Nazi book burnings as a Holocaust. The first mm. time that word is used in connection mm. with what is happening under the Nazi period. Of course, the term we know today, the Holocaust and the murder of the Jews, would really be coined after 1945. Um, Ironically, at the same time, Time Magazine calls it a bibliocost. Hmm. But who knew how prescient this was? You know, the awareness, to create the awareness of what took place, this is so critical. What are you having? I understand you're having a major event in Boca Raton. Yes, well, this is our 20th anniversary year. Mm -hmm. And to thank the American people, we're bringing the museum to various parts of the country, one being Boca Raton. We have a day full of activities on Sunday, December 9th, from 9 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon for families, for adults, all sorts of interactive programs, idea programs, workshops, discussions on how the Holocaust was possible. And we're concluding it with a tribute to Holocaust survivors and World War II veterans. And it's free and open to the public. And this is December 9th in Boca? At the Boca Marriott. At the Boca Marriott. It's amazing. Do you know that there are more? Holocaust survivors in South Florida than anywhere else? Yes, and that's why we're starting our 20th anniversary year here in South Florida. You, I'm telling you, you've done such a remarkable job. Well, it's wonderful to have partners like you who help us with all this. You know, really, it touches our heart. I think this part is so crucial to why this exhibit is important. Share this. Absolutely, because in 1933, the Americans were so deeply offended by the book burnings because of their respect for freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And so 1943, 10 years after the book burnings, we're in the middle of the war. And our government reminds the American public of the book burnings to remind America what this war is all about. So you see on the 10th anniversary in 43, Franklin Roosevelt saying, books cannot be killed by fire. Books are weapons in the war yeah. of ideas. And here's another one. This is the enemy, a dagger through the heart of the most respected book. That's the so Nazis powerful. burned yeah, these books, so but free Americans can still read them. Wow. You know, there hasn't been a time when I've been with you, and Susan is going to learn this as well, that I haven't been moved by everything you've said and everything that you do. It's, it's remarkable. Happy 20th well, anniversary. thank you, and come back anytime. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for being with us as well. Be with us again next week when we have another look into the Jewish world. Goodbye from Los Angeles. Special thanks to the Kay Family Foundation, lead underwriters for Mosaic. <laughs>